welcome back to another edition of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Our mission is to bring you great interviews with preppers from around the world so you can be better informed and better prepared for everything from a hurricane to the end of the world as we know it. Whether your plan is to bug out or bug in, CampingSurvival.com has all of your preparedness needs, including fish antibiotics, long-term storage food, water filters, bug out bags, and first aid kits. Use coupon code PREPPERRECON for 5% off your entire order at CampingSurvival.com. When disaster strikes, it's too late to prepare. PrepperRecon.com offers molly compatible individual first aid kits for your home, auto, or bug out bag. These kits have everything you need to address a traumatic injury, including an Israeli battle dressing, quick clot, EMT shears, suture kit, stara strips, tourniquet, ACS chest seal, tough strip bandages, gauze, and so much more. $89 includes shipping. To buy your individual first aid kit, go to PrepperRecon.com and click the store tab at the top of the homepage. Order today before it's too late. Today's guest is David Morgan of Silver-Investor.com. David, welcome back to the show. Great to be back. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, the chaos in Greece is what everybody's thinking about right now. So I guess we should start there. Uh, We've seen bank closures, people hoarding gas and groceries. Is that the natural outcome when a country spends more than it takes in? Yeah, it's basically, uh, you know, a, a currency failure. And of course, that means the euro, which involves, you know, lots of nation states. So maybe the better way to frame it is it's similar to what happened in Argentina. And it's happened in Argentina many times. Uh, last time was in really 2000. You can make an argument it happened again after that. But regardless, 2000 was the big uh, run on the banks, and people were given similar treatment to what the Greeks are now, where, well, don't worry, your deposits are safe, they're in the bank, but you can only get you know X amount of pesos per week, no matter what your bank account says. So if you have like a debt due and you have the money in the bank, you can't make that transfer. So similar from those two aspects, in fact, and it's off the web now, and I don't know why, but there was a documentary called The Empty ATM, And that's very appropriate for right now for Greece. It was a documentary on the Argentina crisis. So something, unfortunately, I'd love you to be able to watch uh, all your listeners to be able to, you know, bring it up on uh, the PBS channel, take a look, and they get a really clear picture because it's sort of history repeating. Although in the Euro situation, it's a little more meaningful, not that it, it, you know, it's equally harmful to the public in that country, I'm not trying to dismiss that, what I'm trying to say is that since the euro connects so many countries, that there's this potential domino effect that even though Greece is a rather small part of the eurozone, because it's interconnected with the banking system, it holds a lot more power than you might think as far as what the destruction could possibly be. Yeah, and and you're sort of speaking to the fact that it's Greece is sort of on the periphery of the eurozone, but uh, that's what we saw in the 2008 crisis here in America. Is it started in the subprime markets, but then it worked its way in, and and uh, soon enough, it it had uh, taken down the entire housing market, right? Correct, and that's a great analogy, and it's very very similar. You know, systemic risk means just that—that that, you know, when one domino falls. It doesn't fall by itself, or you hope that it would. It touches another, that touches another, it touches another, and all of a sudden, you know, you get this situation. I mean, if you go back to the housing crisis, and you look at Lehman, and then Bear Stearns, and, you know, basically, my take, this is my perception on it, and, you know, could be argued otherwise, perhaps, but... You know, they were, they, the powers that be, the elites, the banking establishment, the power brokers, whatever you want to call them, we'll call it the, the banking cartel. They were actually letting, you know, things kind of go free market. In other words, the right to succeed is the right to fail. And these banks that were over leveraged and too many derivatives, et cetera, were basically going down the tubes. But what happened was they quickly saw what you're, what we're discussing that they're so interconnected that if they let the quote-unquote free market really do what it's supposed to do, 
it might take down everything. So they stepped in because the whole thing in a con game, and this is a con game, a con game is a confidence game. And the entire system is based on confidence because there's no real meaning or trust behind the system uh, at from an objective perspective. In other words, they're printing you know, money out of thin air and that there's really no backing other than the full faith and credit of XYZ Nation, which means the ability to tax the people so they can't be taxed anymore. That's what full faith and credit means. It means the ability to take from others is what it really, really means. Anyway, sorry, I'm on a rant. So when that started to go down, the bank stepped in and the confidence was lost. So bank A didn't trust bank B's paper and bank C didn't trust bank A's paper. So there was basically for a very small amount of time, there was a complete freeze up between transactions. And when money doesn't flow, you've got a big problem. So they acted quickly. And, you know, I don't know what side I'd take. Probably would take the side that uh, they did the, you know, quote unquote right thing or the only thing that they could. And they said, look, you don't trust this paper and this bank doesn't trust your paper. So here's what we'll do. We will take your paper and give you treasury bills. We'll take your paper and give you treasury bills. Now is everybody happy? Oh yeah, treasury bills, the best paper ever going. This currently paper that I don't trust that bank over there with that paper. I'm taking your paper of Mr. You know, Federal Reserve private, you know, corporation that uh, has the, you know, banking cartel in the United States and very pervasive throughout the, the whole financial system. So things unlock and they keep going. But the idea is very sound, and that is that they haven't solved the problem, and that this uh, this crisis of 2008 really hasn't been resolved. In fact, everything that they've done uh, to fix it has just made the problem worse. So that's the situation in the euro from a big, you know, perspective, getting you know the helicopter view rising up above and looking at the whole picture and how they're all interconnected, and if Greece is, does exit then what's going to happen? Well, you could have, you know, the pig, you got Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Spain, also, yeah, me too, me too. And then you've got this thing with Puerto Rico that they keep saying they can't pay their debts. And then who knows, maybe Mexico will come to the fore and say, we can't pay our debts. And all of a sudden you get this debt collapse. So I'm not forecasting that. What I'm trying to do is paint the picture accurately that there is so much more beyond Greece and it's all interconnected. So there's really no way out. You can't really just like cut Greece out of the out of the picture and say, okay, problem solved. We'll take care of this later. Uh, we'll figure it out later. There, you know, it's a benign, um, you know, tumor that we've cut out of the financial system and we'll deal with it when we can. No, 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 it's not that way. It's all interconnected with the banking system. So it's a very, very tenuous situation. It'd be tantamount to saying that that Lehman was just one institution. Right. And, you know, we let that one go and everything will be fine. And they quickly found that wasn't true. And if you go back to my, you know, bank A doesn't trade with bank B, this whole, you know, QE1, QE2 and all, it's basically what that was was that everyone knows it was reliquifying the banks and helping their balance sheets, but basically they just bought all this toxic paper that I just talked about. You know, this stuff that no one wanted, that had no real value, the Fed just loaded their balance sheet with it. You know, most people don't really understand that. So, you know, they're buying this worthless crap, you know, these Confederate bills that no one can trade with, and all of a sudden uh, that's what their balance sheet is. You know, they've got this great asset base. Well, the assets aren't worth very much. And that's what has happened. So that's the real world we live in. That's uh, why the problem was quote unquote solved, but it hasn't been solved. It's only been made worse. And we're now seeing it start to unravel again. And me and no one else knows exactly how it will unravel, how fast it will unravel, what measures will be taken. I mean, certainly, you know, I mean, in a way, you've got to hand it to the you know, powers that be that they, one, took action rather rapidly, made a decision quickly, and basically, quote, unquote, saved the system. And believe me, I am not rooting for this thing to fall down. I am pretty happy with the status quo. There's a lot of things I don't like and a lot of, you know, rights or wrongs that could be righted. But, you know, when this goes, since we it will be uncharted territory and it could be very cumbersome, to put it in polite terms, Certainly, I would. Uh, I'm not rooting for that because it's going to be like this massive wake up, wake up call, and it could, it'll be distorted. In my strong opinion, that you know, in some areas it will be 
oh, noticeable, but not that noticeable. And other areas will be devastated. Um, and so it's going to be what it's going to be. And I don't see it doing anything more than the 2008 crisis continuing. And this time, will it be saved remains to be seen. And we've seen all these pictures of the Greeks lined up at the ATMs, the empty ATMs, and uh, from from Monday and, and today. And it's a little difficult to feel too sorry for these folks because in the case of Greece, they've seen this coming for the pa- for the past years, uh, and let alone the last two months. It's been it's been all over the headlines of the news. Uh, what were these people thinking over the past two weeks that they waited until yesterday and today to start pulling, trying to get their money out of the bank? Yeah, well, sorry for the corny thing, but you know when you snooze, you lose. I want to interject here and make a stronger point that a uh, good fund manager friend of mine, excuse me, a uh, financier that deals with a lot of fund managers, called me and spoke to some of uh, his contacts in Greece. Uh, I have one uh, pretty good subscriber there, but. You know, many of them more awake, if you want to use that terminology, where, you know, they don't trust the IMF, they don't trust the World Bank, they don't trust the euro, they don't trust the banking system, they don't trust anything. So what they did was what you and I would do, which is hedge their bets in precious metals and get a low cash position in a bank. So if they are Cyprus, they're not going to get much. And so... I don't know what percentage of the population did that and were there, you know, months and months and months ago, but some percentage were. And then there were some people that uh, woke up as it was unfolding, as you just alluded to, that said, you know what, this is just too obvious. Something bad's going to happen. I'm getting my money out of the bank. I'm getting a lot of it out or whatever. And then <clears throat> there were those that woke up too late. It's like, oh, I need to go to the ATM and get my money out. Uh oh, look at the line. Well, I'll stand in line and wait. And then, of course, you know, they either got their money or they didn't, or they're getting their 60 euros, uh, or now nothing. Uh, I heard that they might open for pensioners, so the pensioners can get some money. But going back to the empty ATM, because I think it bears repeating, you know, even when they opened the banks back up in Argentina, they just opened them up and said, okay, from now on, it's, you know, 60 euros a week, period, no matter how rich you are, no matter how much money you have in the bank. And wow, what would, that, what would that do for everybody? I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just suggesting that we have real life facts that you can go and unfortunately you can't see the movie anymore. But, um, you know, you can research it for, your, <clears throat> for yourself on, on Google and see what I'm talking about. And, you know, so even if that's, is, you know, what happens, let's say that that's the status quo for the next three months for talking point. Then what does that mean to people that are sitting there in Italy and Spain and Ireland? What are they going to think? Wow, I'm not going to leave my money in the bank. If the same thing happens to us and I can only get, you know, 60 euros out a week, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, <laughs> I'm in dire straits. I, I'm in a world of hurt. I better do something. So you see how the psychology is more important in some aspects than the actual physicality of what the banks decide to do or not do. Because most people, or I would say most, but some number of people will wake up and then start a bank run prior to the event happening, which you did see in Greece. And so that could spill over into these other countries. In fact, I would, I would say it probably will. It's time for a quick break, and we'll be right back. The dollar's lost over 90% of its purchasing power since 1971. Silver, on the other hand, has proved to be a very stable form of wealth preservation over the years. And where do you buy silver? Silver.com, of course. Silver.com offers fantastic prices on silver and gold. Check out Silver.com today. Whether it's a grid down situation or just a temporary power outage from a storm, a sun oven will allow you to harness the power of the sun. Not only will you conserve resources, you'll maintain operational security by not sending up smoke. You can cook or dehydrate just about anything, including bread, muffins, roasts, jerky, beans, rice, and so much more. Go to sunoven.com forward slash prepper recon for an $80 discount off a deluxe package and could we ever see a bank holiday like that here in america and uh and if so do you think it's too early for folks to start sticking some cash under the mattress now here in america I mean, and is it, is it better to be maybe even a couple of years too early than than 30 seconds too late 
Absolutely. I mean, that's a well-known phrase in our business, you know, rather be two years too early and two minutes too late, certainly, or, or a variable of that. So certainly, uh, and, you know, people say, well, you know, David, you're like anti-fiat. I'm anti the principles of fiat and certainly, but in the real world that we live in, you know, dollar bills are physical things that people trust and will trust till the very end. And they may not ever get to a point where they're not trusted. Uh, that remains to be determined. But <clears throat> that is a good idea. Uh, of course, you want the ultimate currency as well. You want, you know, gold and silver coins. And again, you don't need to overload. In other words, you don't need to be in a situation where that's all you have because there are other asset classes that you should probably own. I mean, if you want to get down to brass tacks, depending on um, how much you believe the, the possibilities of these different scenarios taking place, you know, having food isn't a bad idea. I mean, it's a no-lose bet, especially if you buy things that you really like to eat. I mean, I'm pretty big on beef, and I like organic uh, raised beef, and I have a friend that does it, and I fill my freezer every year, get a fairly good discount for buying in bulk, and I'm done. You know, not that that's all I buy, but what I'm suggesting is that you know, no matter what happens, I've already paid for that. That's a pretty nice thing to have. Uh, so that's the idea that you want to um, be prepared, but not go so uh, so much off of the middle ground, so to speak, or the golden mean that you're just wanting to just go all one way and I'm ready when it happens, I'm all set. Because money alone is not going to save you in these scenarios that will unfold. I mean, it's going to be great to have some wealth protection and it's going to be great to have some precious metals, but there'll be such disruptions in the supply chain and in the foodstuffs and in a lot of areas that we take for granted now because there'll be like trade wars and everything else. So this is a worst case scenario. Is this going to happen, David Morgan? And the answer is I'm not certain, but it certainly could. So, you know, something you take for uh, granted as an example, like, um, you know, grapes any time of the year kind of thing. You know, you might go to the supermarket and they're not there anymore. Why? Well, they're being grown in South America and Mexico, but they're not being shipped because, you know, there's a debt re repudiation going on in Mexico with the uh, IMF or something. I'm just kind of making this up not to make it up and be cute. I'm trying to give people a sense of reality of, you know, money alone isn't going to be the answer. You're going to have to be really awake, astute, aware, and you're going to have to think outside the box and you're going to have to build a community of like-minded people that are willing to help each other because I think you're going to see disruptions. I think three years from now, two to three years from now, it's going to be a much different reality than we have today. The things that we've taken for granted that would always be there might not necessarily be there. Things that are cheap now may be very expensive or non-existent. Things that we value highly now may not be valued as much. I mean, you might buy a flat screen TV for four bucks. I'm joking, but I'm trying to give the right idea. So these are the situations that we I see just over the horizon. Uh, and that's just a sample. Is it exactly? No, I'm trying to give you the correct idea, not the exact, you know, flat screen drops in price drastically, which it could. But the idea is that, hey, I've got gold, I've got silver, and I'm going to be A-OK. -okay. Things in my life will always be the same. No, they won't. You'll have gold, you'll have silver, you'll be in better position than many, many people, but they are not going to be the same for nearly everyone. And the folks in Greece are finding this out right now because the people that own the stores are not able to restock their shelves right now because they're on the same uh, capital-controlled system that everybody else is on. And so you can't very well restock a store on on uh, 60 drachmas so, uh, or 60 uh, euros, rather. Um, and I probably wouldn't be able to do it on 60 drachmas either if they go back to the drachma. But uh, it, either way, uh, like you said, if if those folks did if they don't have the food supplies stocked up in their homes, uh, a lot of people are going without right now in Greece because the stores aren't able to resupply because they're under the the same capital controls that everybody else is under. Yeah, well said, Mark, and thanks for that because you know there's nothing like reality to wake people up. And you know if you're in Greece right now, I mean it's like the reality call of all reality calls. And it's not. And once those supply chains break down, they're not easy to restart. I'm going to digress a bit, Mark, if you let me. But you know, one of the books I, you know, I'm an avid reader, and I certainly don't read as much as I like to anymore. But the point is, I read the uh, Collapse of Complex Societies, 
and it was a pretty much of an academic read. And I got through it. And I thought, well, what did I really learn? And, you know, you got the Mesopotamian Empire, the Byzantine, the Greco Roman, the Greek, the Roman. I mean, it goes on and on. And they're all very well researched and studied. And all these academics say, well, it was the food, it was the weather, it was the war, it was this. And there's, they make great arguments. And I thought, God, I really didn't get much out of it. And then when I finally did some more critical thinking, I probably could have got this without reading the book, but it was. Very obvious when I say it, it was profound to me because it was an aha moment for when I say it, people say, well, wow, David, I already know that. But no matter what the cause was, once it started down, it was hard to get back up. And that's my point about Greece. You know, maybe they get this quote unquote resolved, which I doubt, but let's say they do. But because the supply chain has been broken and the capital controls have existed, for those shopkeepers to get their supply chains back open and get the shelves full again and, you know, back to normal life, you know what? That may never happen again. And I hate to use the word never, but let me say it more that it's it's po quite possible that it, from now on will be different even when things are quote unquote resolved. Am I making that clear? I hope I am, Mark, because I want people to understand that um, – that's the new normal, and it's only starting in Greece, but it's going to be the new normal pretty much on a global basis if and when this uh, financial system unravels further. And let's just talk a little bit more about the folks in Greece and uh, great points about um, you know needing, needing to have the supplies. But let's say best case scenario, they are able to restock the shelves. Um, they get through this. Let's say that the referendum passes and 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 Greece decides they're going to leave the euro and they're going to go back to the drachma. Um, if if you were there, would you rather to have your currency now in drachma or would or do you think that silver would be maybe a little bit more stable place to have it because uh, uh, a country like that with that level of debt and and no political will to take any type of uh, austerity or any type of cuts. Um, what's going to happen to the drachma? <laughs> yes, very well taken point. I mean, this thing's been going on for three years, as you know, and one of the more astute in the industry and probably doesn't get as much credit as he deserves is Hugo Salinas Price. And about three years ago, he wrote a an article about Greece going back on the silver coin and what it would mean. In fact, uh, David Smith, that's our senior analyst, reached out to him recently and, and you know, resurrected that idea, so to speak, and we had a bit of a chat uh, about it. But certainly any stable currency uh, or really money, I mean, currency is different than money uh, in legal ways, but something stable like a silver uh, situation would be so much better for the people. But, you know, so few people understand it and could it be implemented at this point? Um, yeah, I mean, I would never give up and say, oh, no, it couldn't. Uh, in some ways, it probably is. I mean, there's somebody right now, as we're talking, that's probably trading, you know, a tenth of an ounce of silver for some good that uh, is valued by them, and the person values the silver more than the good, and it's an exchange being made as we speak. Certainly, it wouldn't be something uh, pervasive, wouldn't be all over Greece. It's a very few that would even have the knowledge of why it was important. But no, I belabor the point, but no, that's something that certainly the world needs. I mean, the world at large needs to have a stable financial system, which means a stable monetary base, which means something that everybody trusts. And regardless of what side of the fence you sit on about, uh, you know, technology and Bitcoin or whatever, you know, gold and silver have, have maintained that ability to be trusted for thousands of years. And there's not one paper currency on the planet that can say that. And there's a reason for it. And and I can just hear folks out there right now going, yeah, but that's Greece and and, and that's the drachma. But uh, but the dollar is much, much more stable than that. But uh, I think if you if you took a, a silver dollar, which was worth a dollar when they quit making them in 1964, uh, now it's uh, substantially more than that. It'd be about 11 bucks today, wouldn't it? Yeah. It would. Uh, in fact, I can't do the math in my head, but a silver dollar is actually about three quarters of an ounce. Um, so whatever that is, it'd be uh, somewhere around 12 bucks, I'm guessing, something like that. Yeah. Uh, 12 fiat dollars or 12 Federal Reserve notes, really. But sure, it's a, you know, it's a factor of 12. 
and it's really undervalued. In fact, we did something on the Morgan Report for our members about the true money supply and how you figure out what the theoretical price of gold and silver in paper terms is. And if you do that study, and we did it, and it took us a while to do it, what you'll determine is that you know $16 silver right now is basically the same as $5 silver was in the early 2000s. Why? Because the true money supply has been increased by that that amount by that factor of you know threefold or fourfold. And so what it means is that if you base it on the true money supply, which is like M1 currency and checkbooks and savings accounts, and divide it by the theoretical amount of gold that the Treasury says it has, which is mm, doubtful, then you come out with this <clears throat> with this amount of uh, you know this ratio of how much paper per ounce of gold. In that case, it's like in the twelve thousand dollar range. So. Does that mean you know gold's going to get to that price? And you can you can go read an earlier article called "Engineering the Price of Gold." Google and David Morgan "Engineering the Price of Gold." You can get a better view of that whole idea. It's a pretty simple concept. It's just a basic arithmetic problem. But the point I'm making is that one, the metals are undervalued. Two, it's just a number, but we get used to those numbers. I mean, if you look at reality. The average American worker's wages have not gone up since 1972. Oh, yeah, but I used to make 20000 and now I make 50000 Just a number. The number is really meaningless, but you're programmed, you're brainwashed to believe that 50000 is a bigger number than 20000 Well, guess what? You're right. But as far as what the purchasing power is, it's actually less than it was back in whatever year you want to pick because it's been a steady deterioration of the standard of living for the average American worker over time. And you could argue, well, David, we've got an iPhone now and I've got a flat screen TV and you know, my air conditioner is more efficient than it used to be. And all those things are true. And so the lifestyle itself might have increased, generally speaking, across the board because people are productive and inventive. And I'm not trying to discount that. What I'm trying to do is look at it as objectively as I can on a pure monetary basis. And on that basis, they're worse off than they were. Yeah, and, and even if we are better off, how much more better off would we have been? And I don't know if that's really correct English, but yeah. how much more better off would we have been if the government wasn't pilfering our bank accounts through monetary creation? Unbelievable. I mean, if there were not the restrictions, and of course, you know, and I'm going to circle back on this, but if it was a true free market, it would be unbelievably better, but there would be more risks. And the reason is that in a true free, true free market, it's more beholden on the investor to determine caveat emptor, buyer beware. Because some people's idea of a free market are what the sociopaths and psychopaths do to us now. And that is that their idea of a free market is if you're stupid enough to give me your money, I have a right to steal it from you. I'm just going to do it in a white collar crime, crime manner through this bogus company. And that's unfortunate that there's those type of human beings that exist, but you know what they do. So in a true free market, it's a little bit more beholden on the you know on the investor to you know ask themselves and it's always true now i mean it's true now and the idea that the regulators are going to protect you or is almost a farce in my opinion and my experience i mean i was ripped off rather massively and i want to go into it but it's even the best you know i'm not the best but i've been a pretty good investor for a long time but it's a situation and i took the risk and i knew what i was doing and you know buyer beware so I, you know so all that applied and i applied it but nonetheless, it was a pretty big deal, and it didn't go through, and it was a regulatory situation that I could get the authorities involved, and they just basically blew it off. I mean, it's like, you know, and I didn't even want to rely on them. It was kind of a last-ditch thing, and actually my broker was the one that said, well, we should get them involved. And I'm like, yeah, okay, fine, go ahead. And he put all the legal paperwork together and sent it off, and it got lost in the pile of crap that they deal with all the time. So I'm not trying to badmouth the regulators. I'm not trying to badmouth anybody. What I'm trying to do is wake people up to, yeah, the free market would do much, much better for everybody, but there was less regulation and all that. But it comes with a price, and the price means that you are more responsible than ever in a true free market. And a lot of people don't make that point, Mark, and I think it has to be made not only from my own experience, but from, you know, my studies. So it's like, oh, well, it's great. And, you know, I'm on that bandwagon. I'm raw, raw, raw. But there's no perfect system. 
you know, a free market is better than what we have. It's better than all the interference. It's better than all the controls, better than all the, you know, heavy taxation and all the control mechanisms that are in place. But there isn't a perfect system. And the reason is that we're human and no one in the human realm is perfect. So you're going to have these ups and downs. You're going to have these ins and outs. You're going to have good and bad. You're going to have no investment. Not every investment is going to work out perfectly. But nonetheless, it's the best system by far that's ever been established. And unfortunately, we haven't had, you know, true free markets in a very, very long time. And it's doubtful that we'll see them back anytime soon. And you made a, a great point about the, the regulators, and they, they sort of give folks this this false sense of, of confidence, uh, misplaced confidence, I guess we could call it. Uh, speaking of Greek debt, you know, John Corzine that, that swept all of his uh, investors' funds into making a, uh, a risky deal on, on Greek debt and, and lost everything. You know, he's still walking around a free man. Uh, Goldman Sachs took both sides of the deal on, on the, the subprime uh, CDOs and uh, made out like bandits and, and no one was ever brought to justice over that. So uh, there's kind of a lot of misplaced confidence in the regulators and, and maybe if they weren't there, people would, would be more aware and, and be, be more of a, uh, a buyer beware type situation because they wouldn't have that, that, uh, that, uh, misplaced confidence there. And then uh, you, you mentioned treasuries. We'll go back to that. Uh, it, back in 2008, and that was kind of the thing that everybody was buying, you know, that, uh, that, that that's, that's where they thought was the safe place to be. Well, with this Greek uh, tragedy, I guess we'll call it, um, folks are pouring back into treasuries, and it's actually pushed the dollar up against other currencies. And, uh, and in a time when you think that people would be blocked flocking to gold and silver, it's actually bought the gold and silver prices down. Yes. I'm not totally surprised by it. I've been through this <clears throat> before. Uh, if you type into Google, uh, John Exter pyramid, Exter's E X T E R. Uh, so I've written a few articles about it and others as well, but basically the run is the run to safety. That's people, what they do. It's like, I'm scared. I'm going to get as safe as I possibly can. And the perception for probably a good 90% of the global population is cash is king. And if I have cash, I'm safe. And so you'll see a huge run in the dollar as the safest currency to be in before you see the run to gold. But the savvy money is in, in a run to gold, and how they can satisfy that demand is through the paper markets. But there will be a time when the paper markets start to break down. So it's really the natural order of the run to safety. There'll be first a run to the dollar and then a run to gold. And uh, while we're on the subject of treasuries, prior to the Greek crisis, we were seeing bond yields starting to creep higher. Uh, do you think the U.S. economy is on a strong enough footing to deal with rates at historical norms? No. No, the idea a lot of people have is that interest rates will destroy the, um, the gold market. And in a way, they're right, but only if you think it through all the way. If you go back, and of course, I've lived through one complete you know, bull market cycle. And so what happened was the real inflation rate as put out by the government using generally accepted accounting principles, which is what John Williams of shadowstats.com still presently does. So you get a very clear picture of what's really going on. You'll see that the inflation rate is 13% around 1980. And Volcker put up interest rates to about 17, 18, even 20%. So the real rate was 20% minus the inflation rate, 13. So you're getting 7% on your money, six, five, five to 7% which is pretty normal in capital markets. But it only took down gold when the real rate of interest was high enough to get money out of gold and into money into a level of interest that was giving a real return. So let me make myself crystal clear. If you use shadowstats.com and look at the true inflation rate today, I'm going to pick a number because I don't know. I haven't seen John's work in a while, but let's say it's 7%. So if interest rates don't get to 8%, where you're getting a 1% real rate above real inflation, you're not making any money whatsoever. Oh, yeah, I'm getting 5%. Well, you are, and that's what your bank account shows, or your, you know, your yield on your stock that's 5% or whatever it is, and that's a number, and that's what you're getting, but it's not keeping up with real inflation, this you know, 2% 
and inflation. I think most of your listeners, at least, are well aware of it's a joke. I mean, you're not taking factoring in food and energy. Uh, they have this hedonic indexing, substitution methods, and all this ridiculousness that people buy into that don't know better. That you know the government knows what it's doing. So. That means they could raise interest rates, and I think they will. I think they're going to show how tough and powerful they are, and they'll move them up a quarter point or half a point or 1% over the next year. Oh, we're so tough, and it won't have much effect on gold at all. In fact, it should have no effect. In fact, it probably have an opposite effect. And so that's the real story on interest rates. Interest rates are only going to attract from the gold market if and only if they are above the real rate of inflation. And you cannot, Mark, cannot put interest rates above the real true rate of inflation, five, six, seven percent, whatever it really is, without a crash in the entire global system. And the reason being is that if they were that high, there wouldn't be enough money to pay back the interest on the debt that's on the backs of the taxpayers right now to be able to pay it. So basically, you would totally collapse the economy that's already collapsing as we speak. So we're in a situation that the world's been in before. You don't have to panic. It's not the end of the world, but you have to be cognizant of what you need to do financially and what you need to do as a human being. You know, you might think outside the box and say, well, what if this job that I have that's based on uh, the financial derivatives market goes away? What else can I do? And how can I be of maximum and best use to my fellow human being or my maximum and best use to myself that serves my fellow human being that can help us go through this, I'll call it transitionary phase, till we get back to some honesty and integrity in the financial markets and basically in our in our in our communications with others. I mean this idea that, you know, people rule over us because they know better than us is ridiculous. The whole principles that were founded were that the people themselves were perfectly capable of living their own lives and they didn't need much interference. That's why it was set up and the idea that the individual had equal rights to everyone else because you wanted to have a rule of law, not that we're all equal in height and weight and intelligence and all that. No, every human has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and they could go about their daily affairs in a free and just manner without being interfered with by anyone. That was the idea. And of course, it's so upside down now. It uh, basically, you know, it hardens me up <clears throat> in an emotional way when I think about it because uh, we are so far from that ideal right now. Hey, preppers and patriots. That's the end of the first half of my conversation with David Morgan, the silver guru. Tune in next week for the second half. God bless and happy prepping. In the days of Noah, book two, persecution by best-selling author Mark Goodwin. A globalist conspiracy transpires by way of a false flag attack against America's energy infrastructure. Noah and Cassandra Parker witness a complete economic meltdown, which is intentionally triggered by the event. The assault is blamed on patriots and Christians who are rounded up into detention centers across the country. Noah and his friends must take action to prepare for the meltdown and defend against the totalitarian regime which is gunning for their freedom and, quite possibly, their very lives. Get your copy of The Days of Noah, Book 2, Persecution for Kindle, paperback or audio edition at Amazon.com today.